Before proceeding with the examination of the cervical spine, let us review the structure. This spinal region is made up of seven vertebrae. The first two, the atlas and axis, are non-typical. Of note is the foramen transversarium, located within the transverse processes. These foramina allow passage for the vertebral arteries, veins and sympathetic plexus. The cervical region is the most mobile part of the spine. In particular, the atlantoaxial joint, being of pivot design, it allows up to 45 degrees of rotation. Let us begin the examination of the cervical spine with a general inspection of the neck. As emphasized earlier, the general guidelines for observation and palpation will not be repeated for each section, but you must ensure that you include this in your examination procedure. Observe the cervical curvature. Note increased or decreased lordosis, or if the head is held in side flexion or in a forward posture. Note any evidence of congenital abnormality like Klippel fail syndrome or Sprengel's shoulder. Is there an association between the cervical spine to any postural abnormality of the shoulder girdle or the thoracic spine? Please observe the general principles of observation and palpation covered in the chapters above. For the cervical spine, palpation must include structures such as the articular facets, the spinous and transverse processes. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah. I'm just going to feel the uh, muscles of your neck. Just uh, relax for me. Okay. Just uh, rotate your head to the side there. Ask the patient to perform the following active movements to their full range, flexion, extension, rotation, and lateral flexion. I get you to um, drop your chin down to your chest as far as possible. And now look at the ceiling all the way up. That's fine. Look this way. That's fine. Now the other way. That's fine. Now look straight ahead. I get you to drop your ear towards your right shoulder and now the other way. That's Ask fine. them to let you know if any of the movements produces pain. You should change this order if it is anticipated that one of the above movements will be particularly painful. For accuracy, the painful movement should be performed last. Now evaluate the passive range of movements. For the cervical spine, it is advisable to position the patient supine in order to relax their muscles. Take the neck into flexion. Now I'm just going to bend your neck. Just let it go heavy for me. Extension. Rotation. And lateral flexion. And your neck to the side. If the patient allows it, end feel of all ranges should also be tested. Each vertebra is passively moved on the adjacent vertebra in all ranges and end feel is assessed. This should be done systematically, starting at C1 through to C7 and T1. To achieve localized movement, use one hand to stabilize the head by cradling it, and the other to introduce the focal force through each segment. Your applicator could be the lateral border of your index finger or your finger pads. Take care not to exert unnecessary force and avoid prodding with your nails or fingertips. The other side. Okay. 
depending on your patient's presenting complaint and findings from your case history, you may need to assess the active resisted movements. Place the patient supine and test for flexion, extension, lateral flexion, and rotation using resisted isometric contractions. Can I get you to do some movements? I want you this time to resist me. Can I get you to push your head off the pillow and resist me? That's fine. Can I get you to push down now against my hands? That's fine. Can I get you to now flex your head to the side or bend your head towards your shoulder? And now the other way. That's fine. Hold the patient's head firmly in a neutral cervical posture and ask them to slowly build up pressure against resistance. Each plane of movement should be tested. It is important to brief the patient well to ensure that they do not use undue force during this procedure. If appropriate, ask the patient to perform some functional movements such as getting up from lying supine or to get up from lying on their side. You could ask them to swallow some water, to look over their shoulder and to look up and to look down. Inevitably, in this case, most of the functional movements resemble the anatomical movements performed earlier. In some instances, you may need to evaluate the integrity of the vascular supply to the brainstem. The vertebral arteries ascend through the transverse processes of C6 to C1. They form the vertebrobasilar arterial system, which supplies the brainstem and cerebellum. Clinical features suggestive of vertebrobasilar insufficiency include vertigo, nausea, ataxia, nystagmus, diplopia, hoarseness, and drop attacks. With vertebrobasilar disease, also consider the clinical presentation of Wallenberg syndrome.